Hello everybody, my name is James and I'm with King's Fine Woodworking. Thank you for tuning back in to the third installment of my Extreme Miter Station. This is a quick overview of the completed project for you. I do offer a complete set of plans with detailed measurements on my website, which is kingsfinewoodworking.com. On the agenda today, I will be tackling the miter fence. Uh, the fence will run the entire 13 foot length of the miter station. And we'll also be doing the drawer fronts and the upper cabinets. Okay, so here I am ripping down some of the material for the fence. I've used Baltic birch plywood for that. We're putting a little notch in here so I can integrate this into the fence that exists on the miter station. And I'll show you what that looks like coming up soon. Okay, these are the main components. The vertical piece is two and a quarter inches tall. That's what's required for the Craig top track. The wider piece laying flat is what's going to allow me to attach this fence to the top of the torsion box. And finally the three quarter inch strip is what is going to allow me to attach these two pieces to each other. And you can see how the top track is going to fit on there. All the way down. Yeah, go. Okay for every joint here I will be putting glue and a considerable number of screws. I want this to be a very rigid uh, and strong fence. This three quarter inch strip I'm going to screw down to the base uh, and then I'm going to screw it from the back uh, into the front of the vertical part of the fence and you'll see that here coming up. My intention here is not really to smear the glue around, I'm just trying to feel to make sure that these pieces are perfectly lined up. Baltic birch is pretty good, uh, pretty strong material. Yeah, it's very rigid, usually very straight. I do like to pre-drill it before I put the screws in. And here I'm putting inch and a quarter cabinet screws with a washer head. And I'll put these about every three or four inches or so along the entire run of the uh, piece. Now I'll take a moment with a very wet rag and try to get all the excess glue off of that. Now gluing the front of the fence onto the backer. Uh, don't try this in your shop, we are licensed professional glue spreaders. I'm going to follow the same procedure here, uh, lots of clamps, and then we're going to screw these two pieces together. Whenever you can get two pieces of plywood that you have cut straight, uh, screwed or bonded together at right angles to each other, it makes for a very straight linear surface. Okay, there's the fence. We're going to try it out. Uh, you can see how the notch out is going to fit over the existing fence on the miter station. If you notice, I have taken the top aluminum wings off of that miter saw. This allows me to get my fence over that surface so I can have a continuous straight fence. This will actually allow my Craig flip stop to come within three inches of the blade so I can cut pretty small pieces. What's critical here is to make sure that it's perfectly straight, uh, perfectly straight with the uh, miter saw as well. The clamps are being very lightly attached so as not to warp the level. Now we will go ahead and screw the back down into the top of the torsion box. Okay. 
We'll need to drill some holes in the Craig top track in order to screw it to the miter fence. I bought two of these from my local Rockler store because that's all they had and the third one I had to buy mail order from Amazon. They come in four foot lengths. I gotta cut a little four inch piece of top track to finish the top left fence there. Make sure if you cut aluminum with your miter saw that you switch out to one of your older blades uh, because it won't cut wood as well after you've done this. And the key here is to go very slow and hold that piece very securely. Anytime you cut aluminum on the saw, you want to file the edges a little bit because they're sharp. I had to put a little bit of paper in there to shim it because it wasn't exactly flush with the existing uh, top track. Now I'm preparing to put the measuring tape down. They sell these for both the left side and the right side of the track. It's actually very easy to do. You start with a piece of wood that's 24 inches long. You flush it up with the blade on one side and the flip stop on the other. The Craig instructions tell you exactly where to mark it on the top track and that's where you peel a little bit of the backer away and place that right down over your mark. After that it's pretty simple. You just slowly peel the backer away as you push the sticky part down all the way along the edge of the top track. The measuring tape is actually very high quality. It's metal uh, and it has a very good adhesive so it looks to me like it will probably last forever. And Craig didn't sponsor that. I'm just a fan of their products. And here we're just going to repeat the process for the other side and finish off this line. You might be able to get a closer view here of how my miter fence comes over the top of the one on the miter saw. With the upper aluminum part of the fence removed, my miter fence can just integrate into the saw much better. Uh, now we'll put the little window with the cursor in it exactly over the 24 inch mark because we know this board is exactly 24 inches and we'll screw that down tight. Now I'm going to go ahead and make a test cut, I think at 16 inches, then I can just make sure that it's working. And it looks good to me. We made sure to go over all the corners and edges with the sander to make sure we didn't have any sharp spots.
and a quick overview of the fence system in place. Looks great and it works great. I got one of these flexible hoses at Rockler. Uh, the hose that came with my rigid vacuum was just too hard and rigid and it really couldn't fit up through the hole and collect the dust from my saw as well. My daughter got into there and mounted a power strip for me and one of these things called an eye socket which I bought at Rockler. This thing's pretty cool. You plug the vacuum and the saw into it and it turns the vacuum on the minute you turn the saw on and the vacuum runs for about seven seconds afterward. Had to drill a little hole there to get some of these cords and things through and now I'm just going to put this adapter on which I got from Rockler and mount it to the uh, chop saw. Okay now this is kind of uh, one of the fun parts of the build for me. I went and got these architect uh, triangles or archi architect scales. They're aluminum triangles. I found them at Lowe's. I think they were about five and a half dollars each, so not a lot of money. And I decided I wanted to turn these things into drawer pulls. All I had to do was drill and tap them, and it came out pretty well. After mounting this one, we realized the corners are very sharp, so I did have to sand them. But this is a sample of what everything's going to look like in a few minutes. This is a little jig that I had to make in order to mount the triangles on it. This will hold it while I take it to the drill press and drill it. It will allow me to keep the triangle secure and get a perfectly straight hole into it. I slowed down the drill press a little since I'm cutting into metal and I put a little squirt of thread cutting fluid there. I don't know if that's necessary, uh, but I put it anyway. I set the depth stop on the drill press and went about halfway through the triangle. Just wiping off a little bit of the aluminum shavings there and then I'm going to tap it with a quarter inch tap, quarter by 20 thread. If you've never tapped aluminum before, this is a very easy project to do. And that's it. Pretty straightforward. Uh, both holes drilled and tapped. Now for my drawer fronts, uh, I'm actually using walnut. Uh, it's a walnut plywood. And the reason I'm using walnut, it, it is a little bit expensive to get this plywood. Uh, I think it's about $110 a sheet. However, I do kitchens and bathrooms and I had a kitchen job with a lot of small leftover pieces that weren't usable in my cabinets. They've got some dings and some scratches and I've been sitting on this stuff for about a year. So you certainly don't have to use any walnut for your miter station. You can choose any species you want and you can get pieces of plywood at Home Depot, uh, sanded pine plywood that it's about uh, 30 bucks a sheet. 
I decided to put some edge banding on it and I had about a half a roll here. I thought that was going to be enough. Unfortunately it wasn't so I did have to go pick up another roll. It's just under $14 a roll. I live uh, in Denver, Colorado and at Paxton Lumber in Denver it's about 14 bucks a roll for a 50 foot roll. This stuff's real easy to work with. It's a heat activated glue and you just iron it on. And there's my daughter trying to squeeze in some camera time. <laughs> she helps an awful lot so she can have as much as she wants. I just cut the edge banding a little bit long. After I have glued it on, it cools down in a minute or two. We just trim the edges, uh, flush with the side of the wood a little bit with a straight razor, and it cut, snaps right off. Uh, this is a trimming tool. And it's very easy to use this. This just trims the excess uh, off of each side because the edge banding is a little bit wider than the plywood itself. After I do the sides, I do the end the same way. If you have never used edge banding before, you should give it a try. It's extremely easy to use, uh, and once you sand it, uh, you'll be very surprised. It almost looks like you've got a solid piece of wood. Take a look at this corner when I get done sanding it up close. It's kind of hard to tell that's edge banding. This is a pretty neat little jig that you can get at Rockler. It allows you to clamp it to the drawer body itself and then you can slide the drawer front in and it will position the drawer front for you where it needs to go so that you can open the door and screw it in from the back. I've got a 1 8 inch spacer that I ripped to put on top of the drawer front because that's the distance I want between that and the bottom of my torsion box. Now we just open the drawer up and put a few screws in from the inside. You can see I didn't even wait to finish my miter station before I started packing my tools away. I have measurements marked on the drawer front uh, showing where I want the handles to go and I also like to use a little speed square to make sure I drill in straight. This is what I was talking about earlier. I need to get those sharp corners off of the edge of these architect triangles. They're actually very pointy. Uh, I just have a 12 inch disc sander and it just sanded that aluminum no problem. Okay, so it's time to go ahead and mount the handles. I've got a long screw here. I'm going to put a washer and a nut in order to secure this uh, screw back to my drawer. And I'll put a one more nut on. That way, after I have the screw secured into the architect's triangle, I'll go ahead and tighten that nut down against the triangle.
Okay, I'm going to switch to the front side here and you can see that screw being driven into the aluminum. It is exposed a little bit just because of the shape of the triangle, but it doesn't actually look that bad. And it actually screws in very tight. I'm actually really pleased with how secure these are. So I will just secure the back nut back to the drawer and the front one against the triangle. Okay, so those are all done. All the ones that I put on without rounding, I took them back off and rounded them. And this is kind of an overview of the completed drawer fronts. You might notice the side of my miter station is very, very ugly, but we're going to fix that soon. Okay, a little close up of the drawer. You can see the drawer slides, you can see the dovetails. It's actually dovetailed front and back. And they work pretty smooth. Okay, here I am ripping down some wood to build one of the overhead cabinets. I actually had several of these over the miter station already, uh, but I did, I did need one more, and I wanted to show you how they go together. It's actually a really simple cabinet to build. These are made out of a sanded pine plywood that I got at Home Depot. It's about $32 or $33 a sheet. And I can actually make about two of these cabinets with one 4x8 sheet of plywood. Uh, so it's not too bad, about 15 bucks a cabinet. For most of my workshop furniture, I actually just uh, tack it together with some finish nails and then I'll go back through and screw everything to make it secure. You notice that some of this plywood is used. I ripped it down from some stuff that I just had laying around. The cabinet is basically 24 inches by 24 inches and it's about a foot deep and I just wanted one shelf in the middle of it and it's going to have a basic door on the front. I'm using my speed square to make sure the middle shelf is straight up and down. So for most cabinet work when I do them I typically make all dimensions about a quarter inch under to account for blade thickness so I don't have any waste at the end I can use up all the plywood. So when I have a cabinet that's two feet by two feet it's usually 23 and a quarter by 23 and a quarter and instead of 12 inches deep it's about 11 and three quarters of an inch deep. I like to pre-drill all the holes with a countersink bit. And this is the French cleat which I'm going to mount to the cabinet. And this is how the cabinet's going to hang on the wall. It's basically just a strip of wood with a 45 degree angle cut at the bottom. You want to make very sure that this is secured to the cabinet very strong. Uh, because this is going to carry the weight of everything you put in there. And there's just a little strip of wood here to go at the bottom to bump the bottom out from the wall the same distance as the top so the cabinet sits straight. And that's it. It's a very simple cabinet to build. And you can see them here with the door fronts. It's just a basic cabinet door. And above the miter station is the French cleat. It goes into the studs all the way across. And that's what's going to carry these cabinets.
So we're going to put the cabinet doors on first before we mount the cabinets. And what I like to do is make a story pole that tells me exactly where I'm going to put the hinges. We just line it up with the bottom of the cabinet door and make our marks and draw a short straight line. We use the exact same story pole, set it at the bottom of the cabinet and make the two marks again and we'll also draw another short straight line. This is a VIX bit, V-I-X. It's a self-centering bit, so you can put it into a drill guide or a template, and it will drill a hole right to the very center. This is the Jigget. It's a little jig from Rockler that works with most European hinges, and it tells you exactly where the holes will go. I don't actually normally draw the holes. I just did that to show you. What I do is hold the jig in place, grab my drill bit with the VIX bit, and just go ahead and drill it. Now to put the holes into the doors. This white plastic block is a jig that tells you exactly how far away from the fence to drill your holes. But it's also just as easy to move the drill bit down and measure about 3 16 of an inch and do it that way. We do have the depth stop here going because we want this hole to be a half inch deep so that the cups from the hinge fit in there perfectly. Here I just take a little square to make sure that the cup is squarely in there, kind of hold the hinge down, use that same drill bit, the VIX bit, to put a perfectly centered hole in the hinge. And then I can go ahead and drive a screw in. It's a pretty straightforward system. I really like these European hinges. And I've used many different styles, from the cheapest to the cheap, all the way up to the high-quality bloom hinges. These hinges you can actually get at Home Depot for about four bucks a pair. One thing to be careful of, if you have a cabinet with two doors, is that there's a left and a right. So I like to put them opposed to each other here, mark my doors left and right, and make sure I use my story pole accordingly, so I don't get them mixed up. or worse yet, accidentally make two right doors. This is what I was trying to show you earlier, that this is a 35 millimeter bit. It's also the same as a 1 and 3 eighths, but it had kind of faded, so I rewrote it on there for this scene. And there we have it, a left door and a right door. Okay, it's time to mount the door to the cabinet. If you remember, our holes in the cabinet are already drilled, so now we just have to line those up and screw them in. If you look close at the top, you can see that the door is not lining up with the top of the cabinet.
That happens sometimes and it's a pretty easy fix. You just basically adjust these screws on the inside and it moves the door in several different directions and it's very easy to adjust it so that it's perfect. I want to put a chamfer on the front of this all the way around before I mount these on the wall. Pay no attention to that French cleat on the far left hand side. Uh, the edge of it is not actually thinner than the rest of it. That's just an illusion. And I set it up so we've got six cabinets total and every other one just has a pair of opposing doors. Okay, so there's an overview of everything that we got done today. And once again, this is what the project is going to look like when it's all complete. There is one more uh, episode after this one. It's going to be considerably shorter. I apologize for the length. I'm just uh, scared to leave stuff out. So I just want to make sure that you guys get uh, all the information you need in case you want to build something like this. Uh, I hope you do come back and see episode four. Uh, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing or give us a like.